When I was in the Marine Corps, I participated in a specialized form of swim qualification called the Helo Dunker. This is a simulated helicopter crash inside of a swimming pool. So picture like this big metal tube, there are seats, there are windows, and you are strapped to this seat, not in full gear, but you are in boots, camis, you have a Kevlar helmet, a rubber rifle, and most importantly, blackout goggles, because they wanna make your life as difficult as possible, because they will then submerge you, and then they will rotate the entire structure around in the pool to disorient you, and your job is to detach yourself from the harness and the seat, pop out a window and then swim out to safety, hopefully not drowning in the process. It's pretty intense. And while that may sound enjoyable to many of you out there, and I knew plenty of guys that was enjoyable, I hated it. I did not like that at all. And that's because on one particular submersion, things did not go my way and water just, I will inhaled vast quantities of water. And when you have blackout goggles, you're strapped to a seat and you've been spun around, that whole situation just induced a panic response in me. I was literally drowning in that moment. And now obviously I made it, that's because there are qualified swim instructors who are observing everything and one of them recognized me in, in the situation and took me out of there and I'm obviously here to tell the tale, but I will never forget that panic. That sensation is so unique, it's so scary, and that's what I wanna talk about today. Because as horrifying as it actually is, it's also very fascinating to understand. So we're gonna use the cadavers to look at the lungs, breathing, see exactly what's going on during the drowning process. It's gonna be a fun one. Let's do this. According to the World Health Organization, drowning is the process of experiencing a respiratory impairment from a submersion or immersion in a liquid. And that's probably the most obvious thing in the world to you. I mean, we are talking about drowning after all. But the thing to understand is, you can survive a drowning and still say that you drowned. If you're rescued at any time, they term that a non-fatal drowning. Then if you die as a result of the drowning process, then we call that a fatal drowning. So for me, I can actually say that I drowned when I was in the helo dunker, but I would say that I suffered a non-fatal drowning. Let's quickly discuss some risk factors associated with drowning because some of them might actually surprise you. So the first one I wanna talk about is age. And the younger you are, the more likely you are to drown. We find worldwide, under the age of 15, a high risk of drowning. Now, if you're a one-year-old, you're obviously gonna have a higher risk than say a 12-year-old, but still simply being under the age of 15, higher risk overall. Males are going to be more likely to drown, and we find this is likely because males tend to take bigger risks than females do on average. Maybe uh, he jumps off a cliff or something. Maybe uh, they're, he's drinking around, like say in a boat or something along those lines. It's Again, it's not that females don't drown, it's just that males are more likely to drown than females. Uh, not being able to swim, this one's probably super obvious to you, is a pretty big risk factor, but what's interesting to me is that most drownings tend to occur in fresh bodies of water, so that's lakes and rivers. We do find drownings occur in swimming pools and in oceans, but by far they actually happen in fresh bodies of water. Epilepsy, uh, picture this, uh, you're in a bathtub and you have a seizure. That's obviously a very, very dangerous situation. Intoxication, like I just already mentioned, is a big factor, but that can happen for males and females. But being intoxicated around water is never a good thing. I mean, people have drowned in bathtubs, they've drowned in puddles, they've drowned in toilet bowls, believe it or not. So I hope I'm not surprising anybody by, by saying that drinking and being around bodies of water, not the best combination. And then the last one is actually exhaustion. This, uh, I mean, you could be a very good swimmer, but you're in a very bad scenario. And if you're too tired, you are going to go through this drowning process. You are now looking at a right human lung. And I wanna quickly mention that this is a healthy lung. I know a lot of people are gonna see this darkened color here and assume that maybe this was a smoker's lungs or unhealthy lungs in general, but these are healthy looking lungs. This darkened color here, these are blood vessels. And this is exactly what you would expect to see. These lungs are pink. There's also some dark purple on the backside. Again, this is exactly what you'd wanna see. So these are very healthy looking lungs. But the lungs are gonna be squishy. So uh, that's because it's made of elastic tissue so it can expand. So it feels very similar to a sponge. But then attached to it is gonna be this long tube here that we call the trachea or the windpipe. 
Now, this is just a transport tube, if I can get this into focus. This is just a transport tube, and it's just transporting air to and from the lungs. And then up top, we have the larynx, or the voice box. Now, I can turn this around. This is pretty cool, and you can see this awesome cross-section of the larynx. Now, I did an entire video all about laryngeal anatomy, so you should go check that out after this video. But what I want to do right now is just briefly discuss breathing and how it works. Now, actually, Jonathan made an entire video on breathing itself that you should also go check out after this video. So this will be a real quick and easy version of it. But when you breathe in, I mean, obviously, it's going to go through the mouth and the throat. It's going to then go through the larynx. And it's going to go past down the air, the oxygen is coming in. And then it's going to go down. Let's see if I can turn this around and you can see uh, the inside of the trachea. It's not all that exciting to look at because it's just a hollow tube in there. But the air is going to go down until it gets to the lungs, and that's where the trachea, as you can see, as we look at this medial surface here, the trachea begins to branch, and it branches a lot. And this branching is just going to fill up the entirety of the lungs. So it's just gonna branch and branch and branch until it becomes microscopic. These little tiny air sacs at the end of all the branching are called alveoli. And alveoli are going to be surrounded by blood vessels, tiny little blood vessels called capillaries, and this is where you're going to have oxygen go into the bloodstream. It's going to diffuse into the bloodstream, attach to hemoglobin, and then just, which are on the red blood cells, and then go out through the entire body. At the same time, carbon dioxide will then leave the bloodstream and go into that respiratory tract and then just do the exact opposite trip that oxygen just took. It's gonna then get exhaled going up and out. But we, this is actually pretty important. We need to discuss this real quick the fact that oxygen is used by cells to make energy. It's extremely important. At the same time, cells produce carbon dioxide. That's a waste product. It is very important to get carbon dioxide out of the body, out of the bloodstream. And if you don't, there are gonna be some pretty intense consequences, and that's exactly what we're about to see. Now, the whole drowning process can be said to occur in four stages. Now, you could subdivide those stages even to even more stages, but I think four is gonna be just enough. But it's important to understand that all four of those stages typically happen within just seconds to minutes. It's a very quick process. Now, it can be much more prolonged. Let's say you're swimming and drowning in very, very, very cold water, and then you begin to suffer from hypothermia. In that instance, blood is gonna start draining from your appendages, like your arms and your legs, in order to keep your core and your brain warm and give them oxygen. That means you are going to consume overall less oxygen, because not a lot is going to your muscles. So that can actually prolong the drowning experience. But I think it's probably best for us to assume that this entire process is going to be happening within just a few minutes at most. In the first stage of drowning, there is going to be a voluntary breath hold, and you are going to hold that breath for as long as you possibly can until the urge to breathe completely overwhelms you. I mean, this one's probably going to make a lot of sense, right? It's like, right? you're swimming, you're swimming, you're drowning, you're trying to figure out the situation, you're doing whatever you can, but eventually that breath is going to start to go away, right? The oxygen is going to get burned through, and as that happens, you're going to become more desperate. Now, to understand why you're so desperate, there's a few terms we need to talk about first. The first one is called hypoxia. Hypoxia is when you have low levels of oxygen inside of your blood, even though you have enough blood flow to an area, right? So it's not like there's a tourniquet or something around there. Now, the next one is called anoxia. Anoxia is where there's a complete absence of oxygen to the organ or tissue. That can be very, very bad because if there's no oxygen, cells can die very quickly and you can have an irreversible permanent injury. That's gonna be important coming up. The next thing is called hypercapnia. Hypercapnia is when you have too much or elevated levels of carbon dioxide inside of your bloodstream. Remember, carbon dioxide is that waste product that you're supposed to be breathing out, but here you are holding your breath, so it's just accumulating inside of your blood. And that can actually have an effect on the pH level, right? The, it lowers the pH level of your bloodstream, turning it acidic. We call that respiratory acidosis, so your blood just starts to become acidic, but your body's not just gonna let you do that, right? Say like, if you were just holding your breath at home right now, which hopefully don't, you're not holding it too long, but if you held your breath, like eventually you're gonna get to this point where your body's like, look, I'm not just gonna let our blood turn to acid. So what it causes is an inhalation reflex, right? So you get to this point where you're just completely done and then it's, 
desperately you're going to inhale. But that's going to be a pretty big problem, and that's going to lead to our second stage of, of drowning in a second. But just understand that as these carbon dioxide levels are rising and rising, that's going to lead to panic and seizures. This is that point where it's like you're realizing what's happening, the carbon dioxide is rising, panic and seizures are coming in, and so out of desperation, the inhalation reflex kicks in, and you are now in the second stage of drowning. So you probably see what's going to happen here, right? So as you do that, and you're in water, that water is now going to go into your respiratory tract. So let's take a look at the lung here. We'll go back to this larynx, get that in focus, and as we turn it around, so what you're going to see here is this little flap. This is called the epiglottis, and this is supposed to block off the airway so water does not go into, or food doesn't go into your respiratory tract. But as you have that inhalation reflex, it's going to open and the water is going to get down into that larynx. But that's a problem because it doesn't want to do that. I mean, I, I did an entire video actually of substances going down the wrong tube or the wrong pipe. So you should go check that out after this video. But I'm sure you've been there. If you've ever had water go into your respiratory tract, it immediately initiates a cough reflex. So you're going <coughs> to to get it out. But that's another problem. Here you are in the water, just <coughs> and more water is going to flood in. So in 10% or so, around 10% of drowning victims, they do find that they uh, underwent what's called a laryngospasm. That is where, and it's gonna be hard to tell, but I'm touching with my fingers right now, the vocal cords. The vocal cords are gonna be on either side, and what's gonna happen is they're gonna slam shut. Again, this is about 10% or so of drowning victims. They slam shut in an attempt to prevent more water from going down into the respiratory tract. At the same time, there could also be, I'll grab the section here again, we'll open this up. You see those branching tubes right here? These branching tubes are part of the bronchial tree. Those can also spasm in what's called a bronchospasm. So those can also slam shut in a desperate attempt to seal off and prevent water from going down into the respiratory tract. And this is because your respiratory tract is not capable of digesting and absorbing water. So this is all just this pathway exists to just get it out. But here you are fully immersed in water. This is not good and this is gonna lead us to the third stage. And it's at this third stage that you've pretty much burned through all the oxygen that was available to you. And so you're no longer in a hypoxic state, you're now moving into an anoxic state. And that means trouble. It just spells trouble for pretty much every structure and organ and tissue in your body, but it's especially troublesome for this organ right here called the brain. Now you're looking at a human cerebrum here. It's really awesome and amazing to look at, but what I want you to understand is that this organ, which is around three-ish pounds or around 1.4 kilograms, this three-ish pound organ consumes 20% of your daily calories. That's enormous. That's because there are around 86 billion neurons inside of this thing, all consuming oxygen to work. But here you are, you've deprived it for an extended period of time now of oxygen, and now what's happening is those 86 billion neurons are beginning to die. And when they die, you're not gonna get them back. This is, at this point, you are, you are at an irreversible injury. Consciousness is lost and things are starting to shut down. The inhalation reflex completely ceases, which leads you to our fourth stage. And it's at this point, too much, far too many of the neurons have died. And at this point, the brain just dies. You suffer brain death and it's completely irreversible. And at this point, we can say the individual has suffered a fatal drowning. But remember, if you're rescued anywhere between that first and third stage, that means you experienced a non-fatal drowning. But that does not mean that you come away unscathed because if you got to an anoxic state and depending on how long you spent in that anoxic state, that means you're gonna have suffered brain damage. And that obviously can be very variable, right? There's little brain damage and there's a lot of brain damage that you can still survive from. So depending on how long you're in that state, that means a lot. So while we can definitely say that I experienced a non-fatal drowning, I obviously didn't get anywhere near that anoxic state. I mean, I definitely got to that second stage where I had the cough reflex, the inhalation reflex. I definitely had aspirated water, but luckily, that swim instructor was able to get me out in time, remove the water, and I didn't suffer any cerebral injury. So for that, I will forever be thankful to that swim instructor wherever you are.